So uh, my name is Cynthia Edwards. I'm the Science Coordinator for the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC. And welcome to our uh, monthly lunch hour webinar. Today we'll be um, talking about the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment. And our presenter today is Amanda Watson. Amanda is a research associate at Mississippi State University who works through the Northern Gulf Institute and is based at Stennis. Uh, Amanda left the wonderful world of weed science to study Gulf Coast ecosystems. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Amanda since she started uh, with Mississippi State uh, on this project early last year. Uh, she's the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment Coordinator, uh, working for the last uh, or for the four LCCs across the Gulf and the partnership with NOAA and a few other partners. So um, Amanda says her work on the Gulf has given her a new appreciation for oyster reefs and, of course, all the wonderful seafood we enjoy. Uh, so Amanda's going to give an overview of the uh, preliminary results of the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment. Uh, for those of you who've been engaged in the LCC for a while, this project and mention of it uh, will not be new to you, um, but we've got some really recent results that Amanda is going to highlight. Uh, we should have time at the end of the uh, 25 minutes or so that Amanda is going to present uh, for questions. There's a few ways to ask questions. You can. Um, we do have the call muted today, so if you want to ask a question or break into a conversation, it's star six on your phone, uh, or you can also raise your hand in the chat room if you're on the webinar. Uh, we are recording this, so if there are other folks in your organization who are unable to attend today, the recording will be posted on uh, the website, the same place where you got the information to sign in today. So with uh, no further ado, we'll uh, turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Cynthia. So like Cynthia said, um, this project's been going on for quite a while now, but we're um, finally finishing it up, and today I'm going to share with you some of our results of the vulnerability assessment. So we'll get started with a little bit of a background about why we needed to do, or why we need to do a vulnerability assessment. And so conservation is becoming more and more difficult given the increasing population, demands on resources, and then the resulting in, um, impacts to ecosystems. When you factor in climate change, this can really add more stress to our natural system. Oops, sorry about that, folks. Um, the, we need new approaches now to incorporate these changing conditions into our conservation planning. And in order to build those approaches, we need to know how all of the ecosystems and species are going to be impacted. Vulnerability assessments, they combine ecological and climate information so that we can better understand how species and ecosystems are likely to respond to changing conditions. These tools identify what's vulnerable so that managers can set priorities for conservation action, and then they also identify what factors are affecting vulnerability. And so then managers can select um, adaptation strategies. The goal of the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment, or the GCVA, is to get a better understanding of how climate change, sea level rise, and land use change are going to impact Gulf Coast ecosystems and their species so that we can improve conservation and restoration efforts. We had ecosystem and species experts from, across, from all five Gulf states that participated, and then these results are going to be used to inform Gulf-wide um, adaptation strategies. We um, evaluated the vulnerability of four ecosystems that were chosen based on information and model availability. So we're looking at barrier islands, tidal emergent marsh, which includes um, freshwater, brackish, and saline, and then oyster reefs and mangroves. We also identified a total of 11 species um, that are associated with those habitats. And these species were selected from the species conservation target list for each of the LCCs. And then we narrowed that list down further by choosing species that are widely distributed um, and ones that could potentially be used as sort of a representative for other species across the Gulf. 
Um, and so anyway, under e underneath each of these uh, ecosystems, we have what species we evaluate. The study area for this project is the entire U northern U.S. Gulf of Mexico. Well, and um, we divided the area into subregions to see if species and ecosystem variability vary spatially. These subregions are based on the EPA level three ecoregions. But then we, um, some of our experts said that we really needed to create two additional subregions, one of which is this Laguna Madre area, because there's a precipitation gradient that occurs, so this area has more saline conditions. And then in Florida, we created this central Florida coastal plain, and that captures the vegetation shift from marsh to mangroves that occurs in this area. Our time frame for the project was 2060, and that corresponds with a few of the other projects that are um, going on in the Gulf. And then we also evaluated vulnerability under three different climate scenarios. We had a high carbon emissions, um, high sea level rise, low carbon emissions, high sea level rise, and then low emissions, low sea level rise. And our two sea level rise amounts, these correspond with the one and two meter sea level rise rates by 2100, but are adjusted for 2050. So I hope that makes sense. Um, oh, and I also wanted to mention that we didn't see a lot of difference uh, between our three climate scenarios. So the vulnerability scores that I'm going to report are based on this most conservative um, climate scenario with low emissions, low sea level rise. We use the standardized index of vulnerability and value assessment tool, and the reasons we chose it are listed here in these bullet points, but to highlight a few, first off, this is a Excel-based tool, so we're able to email it to people. Um, and then there's also a habitat and species assessment that are, um, they're, they're independent of one another, but they are formatted the same way. And so since we were doing this remotely, it allowed us to kind of send one email with instructions that covered both assessment tools. This, um, this is a picture of or a screenshot of what the assessment looks like. Uh, so this is a vulnerability module for within this um, assessment. And within a module, you have these different criteria or questions. And experts were for these criteria from zero to six just based on their own knowledge. A zero would mean there's not enough information available. A one would be a very positive effect. And a six, a strongly negative effect. We also really like this tool because it provides detailed information about how to score the question. So, and so this additional um, guidance really helps alleviate some of in the interpretation differences that could happen among assessors since you're not doing it in a group. To complete the assessment, we needed to provide maps for the experts to reference, and we provided those on the Conservation Planning Atlas. So those maps showed the habitat and species distributions, um, conservation lands. For sea level rise, we pieced together any sort of slam we could find that was available for the Gulf. So there were some gaps, um, but we asked people just to do kind of the best they could with the best available data we could find. And then urbanization, we had urbanization maps. And then as far as climate projections, we didn't use maps for those. Instead, we had these um, graphs created, uh, or figures created, for each of the subregions that show air temperature projections, precipitation, and then we had salinity and sea surface temperature. In total, we had 59 experts complete a total, well, 144 sets of assessments. And one set contains three assessments because we had those three climate scenarios. Our goal was to get two assessments per species or ecosystem, um, but at the very least, we wanted one per region. And 
You'll notice that Kemp's Ridley, it looks like we fell short, but Kemp's um, really only nests in Texas within the U.S. Outside of Texas, it occurs very sporadically, and so they were only assessed in three of the subregions. So now I want to talk about quickly just how we calculated our vulnerability scores. So for the ecosystem or the habitat assessment, we combined the scores from the ecosystem status module and the vulnerability module. We just simply averaged um, the scores that were um, calculated for each of these modules. Ecosystem status has to do with the, really the condition the ecosystem is in currently or in the past, and then um, vulnerability, this is where we evaluated like sea level rise impact, cli um, climate change, invasive species. And then for the species assessment, we averaged the module scores from potential impact and the adaptive capacity module. And again, potential impact, this is where we, um, we assess temperature, precipitation, salinity changes, and then for the adaptive capacity, that really deals more with characteristics of the species. So that's a little bit about the tools we use, and now we'll look at the results. So first off is tidal emergent marsh. You'll notice that across the Gulf, it, um, it was judged to be highly vulnerable, except in the, this is, the SFCP stands for Southern Florida Coastal Plain. And so, in general, sea level rise and altered hydrology were judged by experts to be significant threats to tidal emergent marsh. And then the reason that the southern Florida coastal plain ended up be having very high vulnerability is because this um, expert felt that the ability for marsh to migrate in that area was more limited. Um, and then invasive species were also um, scored to be more of a problem in this subregion than in the others. Model duck is one of the species we associated with marsh, and it just had, well, it has moderate vulnerability across the Gulf. Um, and if you took a look at those raw scores, you'd notice that most people felt that any of the threats that we looked at um, deserved a four, which corresponds with, um, you know, a slightly negative impact, but that the species probably won't be greatly affected. And the one standout threat was really the increasing of salinity and the potential for there to be a loss of freshwater habitat. Um, another issue with increasing salinity is that ducklings seem to be sensitive, so that was really kind of the standout for this species. And I will also mention that the adaptive capacity of model duck was also um, that kind of um, compensated for some of the vulnerability. So they think, you know, they they can or they can disperse, um, and just some of the characteristics allow them to cope better. Super. Next up is oyster reefs, and I have these listed together since. Um, you would kind of, you might think that they would be, have the same vulnerability score. But looking at oyster reef first, um, this, the big threats to this for all subregions was altered hydrology and then altered biotic interactions. And the reason the southern coastal plain is um, less vulnerable has to do with lack of information. Um, that one of the experts felt was available to score this, and so it dropped this um, vulnerability a little bit. So then looking at eastern oyster, the threat, the big threats didn't necessarily have to do with direct impacts of salinity and sea surface temperature on, e on oyster, but rather an increase in predation and disease that might occur. And so that kind of matches this um, altered biotic interaction. So potential increase in predation is seen as a real problem. And then another thing I wanted to point out was that the eastern oyster, the species assessment, will take into consideration the fact that oyster larvae can be widely distributed, and as long as there's hard substrate available, oysters can shift up estuary as conditions become more favorable. However, an oyster reef, 
it's not going to move. And so I think to, you would expect the actual reef to have higher vulnerability than the species itself. For barrier islands, um, the main threats were sea level rise, which I don't think anyone be, would be surprised by that. We didn't have any assessments for the southern Florida coastal plain because the barrier island, or the islands are a little bit different down there. And then the reason the Laguna Madre area was less vulnerable has to do with the fact that they've seen beaches um, migrate inland there, whereas other the experts in these other regions they just um, they didn't feel like that was happening. Black skimmer is that we associated with barrier islands. And again, so sea level rise is a threat to that bird due to habitat loss. Um, the barrier islands were also, they're also very, um, a very erosive habitat. So that was also a factor. And then storm surge and runoff and tropical storms, these threaten um, the nesting birds and pot uh, potentially drowning chicks and um, flooding nests. And then I believe Kemp's is the last species I'm going to look at. And again, this turtle was associated with our barrier islands, and we assessed it in the Laguna Madre subregion, the Western Gulf Coastal Plain, and the Southern Coastal Plain. But within this subregion right here, it really just nests in a few locations in the panhandle of Florida. And anyway, um, again, sea level rise is an issue, and storm surge also could potentially inundate nests. The adaptive capacity of Kemp's Ridley was also um, one of the lower scores because of their site fidelity. They go back to the same beaches year after year, whereas a lot of, you know, the birds, um, most of the birds we assess don't exhibit that sort of fidelity. All right, and then one of the big advantages of doing a vulnerability assessment is it allows you to identify research gaps or data gaps. And so these are just a few of the areas where a lot of the species seem to be missing data. So the synergistic effects of sea level rise, land use change, and climate change. Um, a lot of studies focus on the individual factors, but don't look to see how when you add those together what happens. And then also how our drivers might impact biotic interactions because species sensitivity varies. And so there could be an impact to prey and predator relationships or mutualism, and there's just not a lot of research that addresses that. Tropical storm activity is obviously a big threat in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's hard for um, the weathermen to predict what's going on year to year let alone 50 years in advance. Um, but this was a big area of uncertainty for a lot of our experts. And then lastly, genetic information, uh, phenotypic plasticity, that sort of data can help with the adaptive, trying to figure out the adaptive capacity of species. And again, a lot of that was lacking for our, our um, animals. We also went ahead and tried to identify some management actions that could be used to help alleviate some of these threats. So first off, and I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone, but watershed management practices um, really need to take into consideration the downstream needs of the ecosystem. And that was, this is really for all of our systems, barrier islands, tidal emergent marsh, mangroves, oyster reefs. But we also need to be cognizant of what human needs are especially as population increases along the Gulf Coast. Another potential management action, and this is really geared toward oyster reefs, is making sure to um, manage for the fringes of site suitability. So what that means is there, right now there's some oyster reefs that are just, that are living in conditions that are kind of on the limits of their range. And so we need to make sure that as new sites become available, 
that there's hard substrate for larval to deposit on because um, oysters should be able to shift up estuary as new site suitability um, or as the site suitability in those areas becomes better. And then lastly, there's only so much we can do in terms of managing or, or you know, making sure it doesn't get too hot or what happens with precipitation. But we can try and reduce the human impacts to these ecosystems and species. So for instance, raising public awareness of nesting birds um, and then for Kemp's Ridley, all of the experts said that they need to reduce bycatch mortality and they recommended the turtle excluder devices. And then lastly, for oysters, we want to make sure that we're sustaining those, um, I mean, we're sustainably harvesting our oysters. So who do we want to use this data? Um, we want natural resource managers and scientists and planners to take what we've identified as um, vulnerable and then look at what factors are influencing that vulnerability so that they can create their management plans and adaptation strategies. And then, like I showed, we had identified some data needs and though that's a great place to start um, looking for um, projects to fund. We are currently in the writing process of the report. This has been ongoing. We'll, we're hoping to send out our fourth rough draft this Friday. And then once that's completed, we want to make sure that we get this information out there by doing webinars like this. Cynthia is giving a webinar tomorrow. Results. Um, and then also making sure that we get those data gaps um, to people that could potentially do research to address those um, missing pieces. And then lastly, this information is going to be part of a larger um, adaptation strategy for the Gulf Coast, which is this Gulf Coast Conservation Adaptation Strategy. We are going to be presenting our results at the All Hands meeting in Biloxi, and our, we're actually giving two presentations on June 17th, one in the morning and then one in the afternoon. And we're also going to have um, a, we're going to have links to the actual report available so that we can get feedback from the folks that attend that meeting. And then I plan on making those links available um, on the LCC websites as well so that if you're not going to GOMA, you could still um, read the document and give us your comments. And then lastly, we've only looked at a handful of species and ecosystems, so future um, work could revolve around assessing the vulnerability of others that are in the Gulf. This project has tons of people from so many different organizations working on it, um, and it really wouldn't have come together without everyone's input. So thanks to everyone, including, I can't see who's on the call, but if anyone out there completed an assessment for us, it's greatly appreciated. And with that, I can take any questions, if there are any. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, any questions from, from people? Remember, you have to hit star six to unmute your phone, or you can um, raise your hand in the chat room as well. And just further to what Amanda said about next steps and the um, ongoing efforts on conservation design in the in the Gulf region, I see this really as feeding into several of those efforts that are ongoing or or just at the planning stages. So we're really hoping to get this information out to the LCC partnerships and then other partners as well. So if if you as an individual or within your organization have an opportunity. Uh, in which we could highlight this information, please let us know and, and we can either attend in person or provide webinars as, as needed. I don't see um, any hands raised or uh, questions, so
Thanks again, Amanda, for taking the time to present today and for all of you for participating. And please don't hesitate to follow up with uh, questions afterwards if you think of something later. And as Amanda mentioned, uh, once we get to the, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance All Hands meeting in a couple weeks, we'll also be providing links to the documents through the various LCC websites and, and can get that information out to folks as well. Uh, there will be a comment period that we'll be looking at on that on that draft that we present at GOMA. So we'd uh, be very much interested in your feedback on the material. All right. If there's nothing else, I think we'll sign off for today. So have a great afternoon, everyone. And uh, we will have information about the July webinar posted up on the website uh, in the next couple weeks. So thanks very much.